let's pray together in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Dear Jesus, thank you for this day, this time together, Lord. Open up our hearts and enable us to have a greater understanding of the power of your word alive in us, Jesus. Open our ears as we hear. Move your word deep into the very recesses of our soul that your word would take root in us and bear fruit for your glory. Give us new spiritual eyes to see and let us understand this word today. We pray in Jesus' name, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. So let us begin again. Let's all say this uh, scripture together. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. When, uh, many times uh, we are humbled because God is disciplining us. And my meditation was, God disciplines those he loves. I'm sorry, I'm not used to doing this. Uh, meditation for day two, I was asked to share it with you. So. Lord, I know I lack so many things. I have wondered like a lost sheep for many years. I know I have let myself down, and I have definitely let you down a few times. I have learned to acknowledge my mistakes and what I lack. I struggle with understanding and memorizing scriptures, but I won't let this stop me. And I'm not giving up. I have committed to change my ways and to continue in this new path of learning and getting closer to you. I am so grateful that you are always there to help me get up when I trip and stumble. Lord, I only ask that you be my guiding light and that you hold my hand and walk with me in the direction you want me to take. I'm ready and surrender who I am to you so you can guide my life as you wish. Uh, my revelation was, my child, I have waited patiently knowing you would one day get tired of trying to figure out life on your own. <laughs> I have seen you stumble and have seen you get up and acknowledge me. I have seen you in distress and you have always come back to me. You have looked for me more when you are having difficulties in your life, but I never said things would be perfect. I am glad to see how much you have grown in this past year. I have heard you cry, continue to pray as you have been, and know that I am listening to your prayers. I will be holding your hand as you asked, and I will direct your path, and I will take you through the roads that I need you to take. I will put you in the paths that I need you to take and I will teach you how to prepare and prepare and I will give you the words you need to be able to defend your faith as it will come one day that you will need to be prepared to defend the faith you have in me. I will guide and direct your path as you have asked me to do so. Be strong in your faith and do not crumble out of despair. Trust me now and forever. This is my revelation on day three um, with regard to the cost of discipleship. And the Lord spoke and said, You are seeing the cold, hard reality of evil in the world. Pray and fast for those situations. You know how to pray. Discipline yourself so that you are praying as frequently and fervently as you can. Your brothers and sisters need your prayers. Your own country needs your prayers. Every prayer counts. Every prayer is important. Draw close to me, and I will draw close to you. I had a very simple um, meditation and revelation for this scripture, Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. But I wrote, Dear Jesus, you don't want us to be prideful. Any pride at all is an act of disobedience toward you. It means we forget who we are in light of who you are. I am grateful for this Lenten season, Lord, as it helps me put everything in order. And the Lord spoke to my heart for all of us, my daughters. I love you. I want good for you. You are a light in your community. And your witness of love is important. Do not let pride in 
but battle to keep it out. Satan wants my people to raise themselves up in pride so he can bring them down. Guard yourselves from the enemy and humble yourselves so the enemy cannot have a target. Wow. <clears throat> you might want to open up your Bibles to um, Mark chapter 10. We're going to look at um, actually five points today in our lesson. Um, first of all, the main idea from this lesson that I saw was now Jesus had set his face toward Jerusalem. He came to Judea on the far side of the Jordan, but he knew where he was headed. And he set his face toward that like rain. Of course, crowds gathered around him and Jesus taught them. And these were the things that he teaches us in this section. First, he teaches us, he answers the question about divorce. He teaches about how important children are. He teaches about how different it is, or, or I'm sorry, how difficult it is, or how impossible it is for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. But he also teaches us that all things are possible for God. He teaches that there is a reward in heaven and on earth for those who leave everything to follow him. And then finally, he teaches his disciples what will happen in Jerusalem, which is the third prophecy of his passion. So let's look at first um, the question about divorce. So we'll read Mark at the beginning, verse 1, leaving there, he came to the district of Judea and the far side of the Jordan. And again, crowds gathered around him. And again, he taught them as his custom was. Some Pharisees approached him and asked, is it against the law for a man to divorce his wife? They were testing him. He answered them, what did Moses command you? They said, Moses allowed us to draw up a writ of dismissal and so to divorce. Then Jesus said to them, It was because you were so unteachable that he wrote this commandment for you. But from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. This is why a man must leave father and mother, and the two become one body. They are no longer two, therefore, but one body. So then, what God has united, man must not divide. Back in the house, the disciples questioned him again about this, and he said to them, The man who divorces his wife and marries another is guilty of adultery against her, and if a woman divorces her husband and marries another, she is guilty of adultery too. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> so first, that first verse says, Jesus came to that district of Judea, and that was on the far side of the Jordan, and the crowds gathered around him, and... Wherever he was, he always taught them. He was teaching them. And the Pharisees approached Jesus. They didn't want the teaching, but they asked the question, is it against the law to divorce? Now, the Pharisees said they were concerned about the law. But we all know, in this case, they were testing Jesus. That's what the scripture says. They really knew what the law said. They were the Pharisees. They taught the law. They actually had no problem with what they thought Moses had taught. No Jew in that day and time questioned the legitimacy of divorce. They thought it was okay for a man to write a writ of dismissal to their wives and divorce them. But Jesus asked them, what did Moses say? And they said, well, Moses allowed us to write a dismissal and so to divorce. But Jesus said it was because you were so unteachable that Moses wrote that commandment for you. You see, this was not a commandment from God. This was a command through Moses. Okay, but probably Moses just got sick of it. Okay, go ahead and do it. Yeah. But from the beginning, Jesus said that was not God's way. When a couple marries before God, they are no longer two, but they are one body. They become one body. So what God has united, man must not divide. Now Jesus back at the house talks to his disciples and about divorce and that it is adultery. So divorce is a very scary thought. We're Catholic women. We, are, we know that there are 
consequences to divorce. We've always known the importance of marriage because we refer to marriage as a sacrament, a holy covenant. In other words, a couple makes a covenant with each other before God. Some priests will say, well, I don't marry you. You marry each other. The covenant is between a man and a woman. They enter into the covenant together. The priest officiates that ceremony, but he is not the one that marries them. It is a covenant before God. So that covenant is for always. But you're probably asking yourself, what about the teaching of the church? What happens when someone does get a divorce? We've seen divorce and remarriage. What's that all about? Well, the reason a Catholic person who is divorced legally by the law, and I mean the state of California, so to speak, uh, can possibly remarry is that if they are Catholic, it's determined by a marriage tribunal. We're, taking, we're talking about Catholic here. That a true sacramental covenant never existed between that couple. That's why they are allowed to have what the church calls an annulment. They were never really one before God. Therefore, the union never existed as a holy sacrament of marriage before God. And that person would then be free to marry. In our minds, we think remarry. But in the mind of the church, there was never a true covenant, so they would be free to marry because they were never married before. Our confusion comes from our linking the state laws with the laws of the Lord. So let's get back to Jesus said, Moses said this because you were so unteachable, so hard-hearted, so stubborn. And uh, since I take the written word of God personally, I said, ooh, that must mean me. <laughs> So I began to look at myself. Immediately, we want to look around and say, is anybody else stubborn like me or hard-headed or unteachable? Well, I don't need to look around because all I have to do is look in the mirror. Everybody said I was like my daddy. He was really stubborn. Mm -hmm. So I said, he, I know he must have been strong-willed, and I'm really stubborn about God. I want to follow him. So in that light, my stubbornness isn't a bad thing. But... When we read the word, Jesus wants us to be changed by it. So he wants us to look at our own hearts for consideration. We need to change our hearts if we are stubborn, hard-hearted, and unteachable by the Lord and by his word. So we asked ourselves this week, where are the areas in my own life, my own heart and soul, where I am unteachable and stubborn? Not just in our marriages, but other areas of our lives. So I considered my own self, and here's my confession. I think the place that where I have to be attentive are the places where I am most confident in myself. I don't need to be confident in myself. Um, I must always remember that there is more to know, more to learn, and to pray. Um, have you ever um, heard people say, well, we've been doing it like this for 50 years, and we're not changing now. Well, you know, sometimes God wants us to change. He doesn't want us to remain in that stubborn place. So we need to pray and ask God, uh, keep our minds and our hearts open and enable us to not be stubborn or so set in our ways that we cannot change in the way that the Holy Spirit wants us to. I've noticed that I'm most stubborn um, in changing areas of my life that don't seem important to me. So I'm really glad, oh my nose itches, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm really glad that we have the Lenten season because it gives me an opportunity to search into my heart, into the very recesses of my soul, to ask Jesus to show me those areas because, you know, I'm not going to think of them on my own. I'm not. I'm too stubborn, I guess, and I'm teachable. So what I need to do is ask Jesus to shine his light into those areas where he wants me to change. Um, so in changing the areas of my life that don't seem important to me, there are times when they're important to others in my home, and they bring God's order if I would just change these areas in my life. There are times when I've thought, well, that really doesn't have eternal importance, does it? I mean, it's not like when I get to the pearly gates, God's going to say, did you make your bed before you got up here? <laughs> Did you do the dishes? How about that garage of yours? <laughs> so, what is important? Like when I was first married, I didn't like to iron. Actually, I still don't like to iron. But Ellie says she likes to iron, so we rely on her to iron the purificators for us. 
But I would do the laundry on Saturdays I worked, so on Saturday mornings I always did the laundry, but not necessarily the ironing. So every morning I would get up thinking, oh my gosh, I didn't iron Kenny's shirt. I've got to get up while he's taking a shower so I can iron, iron, iron. I'm sleepy there, ironing his shirt. You know, I wish I had done the ironing. You know, early in the morning you wish you had done it like Saturday when I really showed up. So, but I have this story about this one lady. She was so funny. We, we were at this big wedding. It was really a fun time. And pretty soon the guys were all dancing. And so all the other guys, they're taking their jackets off and they're really sweet. And this one guy is not taking his jacket off. So he says, Scott, why aren't you taking your jacket off? He said, well, I'm kind of embarrassed because my wife didn't iron my shirt. She only ironed the front. <laughs> take his shirt off. He was too embarrassed. It must have been really wrinkled, you know. So when I came into a relationship with Jesus, I wanted to bring order into my life. Not just, you know, just these things that sometimes I don't think are important and I can overlook, you know. And I had to consider things like, how does ironing fit into the eternal scheme of things? Well, I decided that I would pray for my husband as I ironed his shirts. So that's what I began to do. Uh, and it really did help me because it was a prayer time for me. It was truly a blessing for him. It used to make me so upset because uh, after a while, we got a cleaning lady that actually ironed his shirts for him. The white shirts were so hard to iron. And so um, I would let her do that. But every once in a while, I'd iron a few shirts for me. He'd say, I don't know what it is about this shirt. I just feel so good today. And I would know I was the one that I said, Oh, brother. I guess those prayers he could really feel. <laughs> but it was a blessing. And then I decided also that uh, whenever I would clean um, my house or clean the toilets or the, the, uh, the stove or whatever I was doing, I would prayerfully do it. And I would thank God for my plumbing. Oh, thank you, Lord, that I have a toilet to go to, you know? And thank God that I have a stove to cook on. I was so grateful. And even when my stove was getting really old, now I have a, a newer countertop. And, uh, but I would just see, I would just bless that stove. Thank you for keeping it working. Lord. Thank you. And just bless all this stuff as you do it. I mean, it's uh, the, the eternal um, idea is that God will bless us as we do it and when we work in obedience. So I finally actually decided that the cleaners do a much better job for me on ironing than I could ever do. So anyway, I don't do it anymore, I'm sorry to say. But there may be something in your own life that just doesn't seem worthy of your attention. And so you stubbornly want your way and not God's way because you may think it is spiritually beneath you. All I can say is, we cannot have our heads so high in the heavenlies that we are no earthly good. Jesus taught us a lesson in humility. When people brought their little children to him, presumably it was on the eve of the Day of Atonement. And at this time, it was traditional that the rabbis would bless the children. The people would bring their children to the rabbis to be blessed, and so that's what happened um, in Mark 10, 13, it says, people were bringing little children to him for him to touch them. The disciples turned them away, but when Jesus saw this, he was indignant and said to them, let the little children come to me. Do not stop them, for it is to such as these that the kingdom of God belongs. I tell you solemnly, anyone who does not welcome the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. Then he put his arms around them. He laid his hands on them and gave them his blessing. Now the early church um, used to do this just before someone was baptized. This would be the question, what is to hinder this candidate from being baptized? This was one of the scriptures that supported infant baptism in the early church. Do not hinder the little children to come to me. And an Old Testament writing of Jeremiah's parables, uh, 191 said, only those whose whole life is a day of atonement, a becoming small before God, is entry into the kingdom under God's rule, guaranteed. So we must humble ourselves before the Lord, and he is the one that will lift us up. Lift us up. Jesus was saying, I tell you solemnly, anyone who does not welcome 
the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. And then Jesus put his arms around the children, laid his hands on them, and gave up his blessing. Now we move from that scene in the scriptures to the rich young man. And so beginning with chapter 10, verse 17, he was setting out on a journey when a man ran up, knelt before him, and put this question to him, Good master, what must I do to enter eternal life? Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. One of our leaders said something really interesting. <clears throat> Jesus admonished this young man, but really, she thought, hoping he would say, Well, you are God. He didn't, of course. You know the commandments, Jesus said. You must not kill. You must not commit adultery. You must not steal. You must not bring false witness. You must not defraud. Honor your mother and father. And he said to them, Master, he said to Jesus, Master, I've kept all these things from my earliest days. And Jesus looked steadily at him and loved him and said, There is one thing you lack. Go and sell everything you own and give the money to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. But his face fell at these words and he went away sad for he was a man of great wealth. This young man most likely had salvation. In Mark, that is not the question, because when Jesus told him what he needed to do to have eternal life, he said, I do that. Okay. But now, Jesus looked at him, loved him. And in another gospel account, Jesus said, but if you want to be perfect, <clears throat> go and sell everything you own and give the money to the poor. Then you will have treasure in heaven. But his face fell. He went away sad because he was a man of great wealth. Now, this is a teachable moment for Jesus. Matthew, um, Mark, excuse me, 10, 23 says, Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how hard it is for those who have riches to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were astounded by these words, but Jesus insisted, my children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. They were more astonished than ever. How could a camel pass through the eye of a needle? That was the largest thing they understood in the world, was the size of a camel at that point, and the smallest thing they knew was a needle. In that case, they said to one another, who can be saved? And Jesus looked at them. For men, it is impossible, but not for God, because everything is possible for God. There was a story that there is a gate that went into the city of Jerusalem called the Eye of the Needle. And to get your goods into that area, the camel had to get down on its knees and crawl through with the person leading them. In other words, there had to be humility. When we were on our knees before the Lord, um, that is humility. But Jesus said, all things are possible with God. It is impossible for any of us to save ourselves because Jesus said salvation comes only from God by grace through our faith in the saving work of Jesus the Christ. But what about being perfected? If we want to store up treasures in heaven, how can we and what are they? So, how can we? Only by the work of the Holy Spirit. That's how we can store up treasures in heaven. And there are some examples that I thought of, we can have gifts to give Jesus. That's why we do this. You know how when you travel on a journey, you say, oh, my mom would really love this. We go shopping when we're on journeys and pilgrimages and so forth. And, and we buy it. Oh, my daughter, she'll be so excited to get this. I just love this. My son will love having this treasure. Well, we're on a spiritual journey as we go, and we will be walking in the ways of Jesus and say, Oh, Jesus, you would love for me to do this for this person. I do it for you. Oh, Jesus, you would love me to help this person. I do it for you. Oh, Jesus, this person is hungry. I feed them for you. Oh, Jesus, this person is cold. I give this coat to you. I give it to this man for you. This is the work of God by the power of the Holy Spirit. In the world, storing up gifts on your journey to give to Jesus when you get home is a good thing. So after the astonished disciples 
find out that there's a danger to riches. You see, their thinking was if a man was rich, he was favored by God. Jesus has been teaching that is not necessarily the case. As a matter of fact, Jesus' teaching was topsy-turvy for the disciples and to the world. So Peter says in Mark 10, 28, he says, what about us? We've left everything and followed you. Jesus said, I tell you, truly, truly, there is no one who has left house, brother, sisters, father, children, or land for my sake and for the sake of the gospel who will not be repaid a hundred times over houses, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, and land, not without persecution, but now in this present time and in the world to come, eternal life. <laughs> Jesus comforts the twelve because they knew he was saying something significant. But also he tells them there will be a cost to this discipleship. It was like kind of he spoiled it. You're going to get this hundredfold. You're going to get all this stuff. It's going to be so wonderful with persecution. I was like, ew. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so they're kind of like in this daze, the scripture says. They're a little apprehensive. Some people don't want to follow him anymore. But he starts on the road to Jerusalem. He sets his face towards Jerusalem. And they kind of lag behind. But now Jesus tells the cost of his life for us. This is the third prophecy of Jesus' passion. Now the disciples don't like what they hear. The first prophecy said this. Jesus said, The Son of Man is destined to suffer, be rejected, and put to death. But on the third day will rise. The second prophecy said, the Son of Man will be delivered into the hands of men and be put to death. And on the third day lies again. Now the third prophecy says this. Chapter 10, verse 33. Now we are going up to Jerusalem and the Son of Man is about to be handed over to the chief priests and the scribes. They will condemn him to death and will hand him over to the pagans who will mock him, spit at him, scourge him and put him to death. And after three days, he will rise again. It's almost as if he's talking about somebody else. But he's not. He knows he is the one. So he tells about the cost of his life for our sake. Well, actually, at this point, they're not only in a daze anymore, they're terrorized. He uses the word persecution in the same breath with those who follow him. So it speaks of his own death thought was going to happen. You were asked about the cost of your discipleship. I have three little examples to share with you. The first one was a simple one. They all have to do with retreat, by the way. A lot of my family members came to one retreat many years ago, and they were taking a family picture, and I wanted to be in it. But at that time, when I was about ready to get into the picture and smile with everybody, a lady put her hand on my arm, and I turned, and she was crying. She said, I need prayer. Well, I couldn't. Wait, I want my picture taken with my family. I didn't say that. I said, okay. So I stepped aside. And so I see this lovely picture that I'm not in. And I like it. But I, I knew I wanted to be in that picture. The second one. It's a little cost of discipleship, right? No big thing. The next one, Babsy Bleasdale was here giving a retreat. And I had just found out that Friday morning they called me in and said, we want you in on Monday morning. You have a lump in your breast. We want to check it out. I was really frightened. And I thought, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, this is really scary. So I, tell, I told Babsy about it because she was already at my home. I picked her up the night before. And she said, don't you dare tell anyone. Do not tell the leaders. Because you know what? She said, the retreat will no longer be about them and what Jesus wants to do for them. They will take their eyes off of Jesus and put their eyes on you because they love you and they're concerned for you. So all weekend, I was, oh dear, I just want to tell somebody. <laughs> Isn't that silly? Sometimes when you share that burden, it makes it lighter for you. And so, but I didn't. I didn't. So that 
And then Monday, it was nothing but a little, whatever they call it, some white looking thing that was like a bone. I, I don't know. But anyway, it was, it was no problem. <clears throat> the third one is about... Oh, it's still so sad. <laughs> but it is the cost of discipleship. I remember Karen saying, every year on retreat, I have to miss my daughter Lauren's ultimate whatever. And I said, wow, you know, that is so sad. I had no idea, but she did it without complaining. That's the big thing, you know. <laughs> All that complaining I do. Sometimes I'm saying complaining. But <clears throat> at this particular retreat, Kenny's mom went into the hospital, and we knew she had cancer. She had been staying with us um, a few weeks before while she went through radiation, and she even helped um, make retreat stuff, which was so fun. And um, so that... Monday, we had gone to the doctor. I had taken her to the doctor, to the oncologist, and we talked about it. And he said, she probably has about 18 months with what's going on and the way that this is progressing and so forth. And I said, oh, okay. So I'm thinking, wow, that's awesome. You know, I thought, I didn't know how soon he would take her, and I'd heard all kinds of horror stories about that particular kind of cancer in her lung. And so anyway, um, so... The night before, they did a test on her. They put her in the hospital just to test some things, how the radiation was going and so forth. And um, she just didn't feel well because she said they put her on some kind of uh, table and spun it around and she was dizzy and she didn't feel good. And I said, well, I won't go to the retreat. And Kenny and I were there with her. And she said, no, no, I want you to go to this retreat. This is important. This is God's work in your life. You are to do this. So I said, okay, you know, I really wanted to stay there with Kenny and with Momsy. And so um, I went with her blessing and Kenny's, and um, we didn't have our cell phones then. So this was 1994, February 4th, 1994. And um, no cell phones, and we had one phone that was a pay phone. I got my little quarter out and made my call. How's Monsie? How's everything going, honey? I'm just getting ready to start the retreat. We were gonna go, we were gonna pray, and registration was going to open at 5, I think we opened with registration at that time. It was 4.30. And uh, Kenny said, Momsy just died. I'll never forget what Karen said. Because she was walking by and she said, I thought an animal was hurting. Because I was crying. And I said, honey... I'm going to be right there. And he said, no, I want you to stay. We're not filming this, right? <laughs> and he said, no, I want you to stay. I said, but honey, I really want to be with you. He said, no, I'm okay. Momsy wants you to be there. She asked specifically that you go. And I said, but we didn't know if she was going to go to the Lord. And so anyway, I did stay. Babsy was there that year as well. We went into my room, all the leaders, and we prayed the rosary for Mamsi. And I just went forward. We never know what God's going to call us to do. It was a simple thing. It was a retreat. I didn't see why I couldn't just come home. But Kenny wanted me to be there. He said, oh, honey, all of the leaders will be so nervous if you leave. <laughs> they probably would have been. But anyway, they could have done it. But we know our suffering cannot be compared to the glory that we will receive from the Lord. We are in our news today. We see so many things happening. A great cost of discipleship. The persecution of Christians in other countries, even here at times. Following Jesus, many right now are being martyred. We've read about the heads being cut off of some Christians, the kidnapping of many, many others for their faith, even children. And so let us pray for each other. Let us pray for the body of Christ who are suffering to keep the light of Christ burning. It's really all we can do. Let's fix our eyes on Jesus and follow him and walk with him.
Okay. So Lord, I thank you for this day and this time together. I thank you for um, the gift of your presence with us in so many ways. And we thank you, oh Lord, for the privilege of serving you and sharing that wonderful gospel message with everyone. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Amen